Good morning, Steve Wells from JJ Roofing Supplies. I'm at our Cricklewood Training Academy for the second edition of Never Just a Roof. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody that's tuned in. Great to see you all. Uh, don't forget, if you've got any questions or any comments, put them in the comments and uh, my little sidekick here, Nick, will deal with them. Um, what is Never Just a Roof? What's the purpose? Obviously, what we're trying to do is we're trying to interview and get people on stream uh, who are characters and knowledgeable people within the roofing industry. So that's absolutely fantastic. Today's guest, Matt Woodjack, he's the chief trainer for BMI Alcapel for the whole of the UK. So it's a, it's a real big job. I've known Matt for a number of years now. We've run training sessions together and I always go to him um, if I've got a question that I don't uh, uh, fully understand and he usually explains it. So let's get, let's, let's get Matt online. Any, any second now. Technology, it's great when it all uh, syncs and works easy. If you can hear us, Matt, pick up the invite. Any time today would be nice. And yeah, we've got a bit of a technology foul there, which is uh, not good. We're going to talk about a number of things today. We're going to talk about rebuilding Britain, um, which is uh, where we're going to start. We're also going to look at uh, pro tips and tricks. We're going to look at things. And here he is. Here he is. There I, we I, go. I, I think was I was doing it request as you see the invite. I was, I was, uh, <laughs> I was almost... Uh, uh, get me hammer and uh, chisel out and uh, start doing some stuff. Welcome, Matt. Nice to have you on board. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Steve. That's great. So we've got a num we've got a number of things to talk about uh, this morning. A um, bit of a uh, little practical tips and tricks. But we want to start. I'm just going to veer away. I want to start and talk about rebuilding Britain, which uh, involves this uh, little beauty. Can you just talk to us um, about the rebuilding of Britain after the Second World War, Matt, and, and how Redland were instrumental in helping the nation rebuild itself and further on into the future? Because this tile is still hugely popular uh, around the country, but obviously, especially in London, Matt. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, it's, the Redland brand has been around for about 100 years, but it's only since... 49 really that we've the tiles have been the main story for us and it was the damage done during world war ii we lost a lot of roofs and redland stepped into the breach and, and with the 49 tile to kind of re-roof those inner urban areas um, the reason it's still a popular tile today is often it went onto terrace rows and if you replace a tile on a terrace row you'll put the same thing on so it's got to match with what next, what's next door so that 49 tile that concrete tile um, what we call an imperial tile, 15 by 9 inches, sort of unusual size for tiles today, a smaller tile. Um, that's what went on to those inner city, area, inner city areas, a lot in the southeast, but you'll also see up in Birmingham, Manchester, anywhere where we suffered that significant damage in, in, in housing areas and had to put those rooms back on. And as you say, it's still you know, one of our main um, tiles for refurbishment today. So where we take them off, we tend to put them back on it's uh, first of all to match in but also it's in keeping it's part of the local aesthetic now it's requested yeah. by planning offices to have that look on the roof as it always so had the, part, for us, part of our heritage has it always had the curve down the down the length of it matt yeah the camber tile that's always been there so there's always been a, a curve to the the 49 tile that's part of what's distinct obviously there are other alternatives in the market similar size and shape but the the four tiles always had that distinct curve too, which gives it a, a nice aesthetic on the roof and it catches the light, much like it does with the plain tile. Gives it a good aesthetic when it's up there on a pitch uh, looking at it. It's uh, yeah, one of the key features of that tile that separates it out. Yeah, fantastic. Do you, know, do you have any idea, since it was launched in 49, how many have been sold or how many have been made? Oh, I'd be guessing, Steve, but it'll be in the millions by now. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah it, it's, it still remains our most important tile for refurbishment um, in the UK. So it still remains one of our biggest tiles, you know, to the point where 
one of our largest plants has you know around 50 percent of its capacity dedicated to making that tile up in shell um, yep. so a very important tile for us but yeah it, it's in, into the millions but i wouldn't wouldn't hazard a guess the number yeah has, has it changed over the years or is it pretty has it stayed as it was originally <coughs> produced do you think i know you're not old enough to have been there but i believe yeah, I'm not old enough to, to go back right to the original, although we do have one somewhere. Um, I have the last one that was made up in Moorhouse when the manufacturer moved out of London about uh, 10 years ago. Um, but no, th there's been no significant changes to it. I think if you look at the very early ones, there's probably been some, some drift in manufacture over the years, but the basic sizes and dimensions, the key feature of the 49 is it needs to interlock with the old roof. So that continuity of the product is important. It's why it's maintained the curve. Um, because the originals have that by, by, by means of their manufacture. So we, we do that on purpose now to make sure the, old, the new fits with the old. Um, yeah. it's, you know, it's, for, for refurbishment on terrace rows and semis, that's absolutely key. You want them to have to slot in. Otherwise, you're dealing with bonding gutters or lead rolls or hips down the, 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 the main field of the roof, which everyone wants to avoid. So it's, uh, that, the ability to interlock with your own tile when, you, when you're refurbing is, is important. And I, I would imagine in all them years obviously there's been loads of uh, innovations and changes just just talk to us about how things have changed over the years a little bit matt well i think the main innovation has been we've been the move to a larger standard what we call a metric tile now the 10 to a square meter um so you know, the market shifted in you know in the days when the 49 went on we were back in imperial sizes had all kinds of weird and wonderful sizes and shapes and non-standard tiles out there and the market's pretty much drifted, I think a lot driven by the house builders um, towards having a standard offer and a standard way of working and having things like a standard 300 mil linear cover um, on your metric tiles, on your mini stone walls, on your double Romans, your groveries, double pans. Um, across manufacturers as well, you'll find that standard 300 mil linear covers developed. And that allows our roofers to work in a standard way on the roof. You know, with those large format tiles, if they're fitting those day in, day out, they know when they strike the roof out, 900 centres, three tiles wide, and that doesn't change you know, with the tile. And you see that even with yeah. some of our you know, more innovative, newer tiles, like Duoplane Cambrian, even though they're a shorter tile, different gauge, they maintain that 300 mil linear cover, so the roofer can still work. You know, it's all muscle memory and repetition on the roof, and you don't want to have to change the sizes and the measurements uh, any more than you have to. And those dimensions have become a standard. So I think that's one of the big changes yeah. that's kind of come in in that, in that, in that time. Oh, obviously, the volume on the 49, has that, has that shrunk as years have gone on with all the new tiles that have come in? Or has it maintained its, its sort of volume, relatively speaking? It, it, it's maintained. If there's been any reduce, reduction, it's been incremental. Um, yeah. it's, it's a very distinct look to it. I mean, you, you'll see the, the kind of postel small format with a roll on the right hand side type tiles they'll fit in the same area um those clay tiles but they never really play, replace the 49 um as a tile so it, it's pretty steady year in year out it's one of our reliable tiles in terms of demand in the market again because of that refurbishment market and just the what goes off goes back on um i think the only the only kind of threat to that in the future is whether we do move towards a larger format as an industry version of it like the uh, the renown um, the Red yeah. Renault has obviously got the 49 appearance with a square roll on it, um, yeah. but it's got that 300 mil in a cover, 10 to a square meter. Um, so obviously that's that's got some cost implications. It's cheaper to install and so on. Yeah. Um, so, but we, we've not seen that as a threat to the 49. It's not chipped away too much at the sales of them. Obviously, part of the innovations <laughs> that this, this, we're sort of talking about nowadays, we're talking about clips and dry fix, and obviously part of today is about pro tips and tricks. Um, you was going to talk about the inner yeah. clip, Mark. Yes. So that, that has been a bit of recent, well, I say recent innovation. It came off the back of the changes to the British standards in 2014, uh, which in terms of workmanship and us catching up as industry is still quite recent. It was the biggest change of a generation. And the, the biggest change is we increased our minimum fix for the roof. So we went from the minimum fix being all your perimeter tiles once fixed and the rest of the roof just as is, the concrete holding itself on. And that was your minimum for the UK. And then we aligned ourselves as we do with European EM regulations. And that turned into every single tile fixed, so a fully fixed roof, and then all your perimeters twice fixed. 
So all of a sudden, the industry had to catch up with that. And if you imagine, it's all, as I said, it's time repetition, uh, muscle memory on the roof, laying a tile compared with laying a tile, nailing it and clipping it, and then multiply that across every tile on the roof. Um, and yeah. the effect of that was slowing down the roof on the roof. So we bought the Inifix clip out as a way of trying to speed them back up again. So as you'll know, your traditional tile clip is a separate clip, separate nail. You put the nail in the clip, put it over the interlock and nail it into the top of the baton. Um, that all takes time. If you watch a roofer doing that, you know, a, a number of casualties will fall down the roof as they pull a clip out of their pouch and several more tangle with it and follow it and fall down the roof. Yeah. Um, so you've got a lot of wastage with that. There's time of doing it. Uh, so what we've done with this is it's tool-free clip. So there's no hammer required. There's no nail required. Instead of nailing down into the top of the baton, it hooks behind the underside of the baton and gives you actually you know, almost four times stronger because instead of you know, with, the, with the force of the tile pulling the nail at the top of the timber, instead of that, you've got the hook being pushed into the bottom of the baton, which is a much stronger fix. So it's all based on tension. Um, and the other things we did when we did this is we took note of the fact that when you take one clip out, four fall down the roof, and we put them in magazines. So instead of having the wastage and the tangle in your pocket now, you've got a magazine which can chuck into that belt. Or if you're clever, you can load out with the tiles because they're in magazines of 50. So if you work it out, you can actually put these on the buttons as you load the roof out and pick them up as you go. Um, the other thing we did was the feedback we got from our customers was once you've opened, you get four on the seat in the van, you know what they're for. Well, we've colour coded them. So you might be able to see it's got a gold strip along there. And that'll tell you that this is for a 49 or a Finland. And um, so even once they're off the clip and they've been used, you can, you can still identify what tile they're for and still reuse them. So it was about and not just answering the immediate need of speeding the roof back up. It was also looking at what's wrong with existing clips anyway. Take the standard aside. You know, we got a lot of wastage and we can't identify the clips once they're out the bag. And we sold those two as well. Um, yeah, and it's a fantastic little clip. It's, you know, it's a one-handed fix. Can we just show you one go on? Yes, please. That'd be great. Yeah. So I've got the rig behind me. So I can't get you a close-up because there's some sand camera on today. A little yeah. trick, with these, trick with these, if you are using them, use an existing clip to pull the ones there off. So they're all spring-loaded. So I'll take the existing one out. And all I'm doing, pinching the clip to my hands, put it over the interlock, and you heard the click behind yeah. the button, and that's just done. So mm -hmm. that's simple, isn't no it? No hammer required. Yeah, really easy. And what you'll find is because because roofing is muscle memory and repetition, the first roof you use it on will be a faff because yeah. you're doing something different to what you're normally doing. You're not using the hammer, so instead of reaching for your hammer, you know, you'll go to go to reach for it. It isn't there because you don't need it. Um, so there's the, you, you'll adapt. But once you're actually adapted to, you've got your magazine, you pull a clip off, clip it on with one hand. It's an absolute piece of cake. Um, you know, we, we always find that, the, you know, the roofers use it. First roof, it's a bit of a fudge while they get used to it. And then they never look back because it's so much quicker. Um, if you've got issues, so they're obviously, because it's going underneath the button, the big issue with that, and one of the reasons we, we didn't launch it at first years ago, was what happens when you hit a rafter. Um, and all we've done with that is you go with one size up. So if you're ordering 10 boxes for a 49, you order one box of red, which is the size up. And that will give you enough reach to go around the rafter. So you've just got a spare one for, for those un, unusual details where you need a bit more reach. Um, but yeah, fantastic clip. And it's a uh, real, real innovation and didn't just change to meet the standard. It also adapted to what we knew was wrong in the industry with, with clips in general, in terms of that wastage and that tangling and that faff factor that comes with, with the old clips. So, so they're tile specific, yeah? They are tile specific, so each there's not one per tile. So, for example, the one I just showed you there, the gold one, will do the rare and, and the forty nine. Um, and the, the, the red the red clip does the double Roman and several others. Um, but there's five colours in all. So they're colour coded, and if you go to the website, we'll get some of their literature. It'll show you. Look at the colour, and it'll tell you which tile corresponds with each colour. Um, so yeah, they are they are multiple, but they are tile specific, and we we stick to that. We didn't want a universal clip. Um, in principle, you know, the, the idea of a uni universal clip makes me nervous because essentially what you're doing is you're creating leverage on the interlock. So yep. on the corner of that interlock where those two tiles are overlapping each other, you're putting a piece of metal in there to hold the tile down. 
Now, if that metal isn't designed to work with that tile and it sits in the wrong way, or even if it's a badly installed clip, it's going to create leverage on that corner. And often when, when tiles get walked on, not that we ever walk on tiles, um, but when tiles get walked on, you put that leverage down on top of the tile, the, bit, the piece of metal there creates that, that point of pressure and it will stop the street corner breakage. So you know, a universal or badly fitted clip can, can, you know, can exasperate that problem on the roof, that corner breakage, by creating leverage just where you don't want it on that weak point of the tile. So we, we, you know, we, we feel strongly that having a bespoke clip for the tile is important. And what, what's the take-up been like on it, Matt? And um, we're almost 100% onto tool-free clips now. It, you know, it was slow at first. It's new technology and it's change. It's a different way of doing it. And you know, that, that trust of we're not putting a nail into a piece of timber. So you've got to get your head around that we're not nailing something in. Um, so there's definitely a job of work for the first two or three years to get people used to using it. But now certainly all of their specifications, 100%, they are all two from tool-free clips um, that we send out there. So all of their Specmaster roofs out there will have a tool-free clip on. And as I said, once the roofers actually get to use it and have a go at it, there's the same with all of these innovative new products. Until you actually use it and have a, have a go at it yourself, if that's when it clicks, that's when you, uh, you realise it's, it's good. And you, you, you've yeah. got to have that trust with the products you're using because you've got to be able to rely on it to keep the water out and keep the tiles on. Um, so, you know, absolutely right that the, the contractors want to be sure of that before they invest in a a new way of doing it and you know and it's got to be faster and it is absolutely faster we did time trials on it and it was four times quicker than doing a traditional clip with a nail and a, and a hammer so it's uh, and for a, you know for a, for a good roof and i'll catch up with this and it's speed up really well and, and obviously part they're, they're okay for refurbs as well yeah it's not just new build is it yeah i mean it's no it's not just new build and the standards apply to refurbs as well so if you know if it's a refurb roof taking old tiles off, putting new tiles on. Um, it still needs to be fixed to the standard and the, the clips work with the tiles. Absolutely. The only thing they're specific to is the tile itself. Yeah. So they work with the tile. Do you, do you, yeah. think, do you think the industry's yeah. still got a bit of a job to do in getting it more into the refurb market? Um, yes. I mean, it always will be that. That will always be the way with standards when they come through. They hit new build first because new build is more readily policed. Yeah. Um, and you've got that demand for your selling directly to a customer, um, the house builder, the major contract, the pressure there. And also you've got people like Zurich and the HBC involved in terms of they're going to ensure that roof. So they've got a vested interest in making sure that in general, there's a high standard of quality going into the market. Um, and then, you know, down to refurb, you often rely on some local planning. And, you know, they're, they're not resourced to go out and, and they don't often have the depth of knowledge when it comes to roofing to spot what is a good, good or bad roof. Um, although you get some excellent people out there that are doing that, it's uh, but yeah, it's 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 not as policed as much, and people are left their own devices. And because British standards aren't the law, yeah. it's not like the standard comes out tomorrow and the police up if you don't do it. Um, but what they are is the best way of doing the roof. Yeah, you know, what, best what practice. The British standard is, is we ask ourselves exactly how do we? There's two things we want for a roof. We want to keep the water out, keep the material on, and all the British standard is is the best way of doing that. You know, with the technology we've got, the design we've got, the materials and workmanship what, um, methodology we've got, what's the best way of doing it? That's the British standard. Um, and that adapts over time, and we need to adapt to keep up with it. But that in the market will always be, be slow because you haven't got that kind of the, the stick to, to drive it through. People yeah. need to see that it's better, experience it, have a go at it. And then, then it, again, like with the Inifix clip, they tend to, once they start doing things properly, uh, they don't look back because a lot of the shortcuts aren't, aren't really shortcuts, are they? You don't yeah. get paid once or you get a problem with it in a, in a court once, that's your business gone. So it's, uh, you know, doing it the right way is the better way of doing it, definitely. And obviously talking about innovations and talking about things like that, it leads nicely into our next, next little part of the, the stream, which is ridge fixings and dry ridge fixings and dry vent ridge. Can you talk to us about, about them systems, Matt? Because I think, I think clips are where dry fix was when it first came out. Now, virtually everything's dry, dry fix, isn't it? So can you just talk to us about the standards on that and, and, and what Redland's approach is? Yeah, it, it's, it, it, you know, it all, again, stems back to the changes in 2014. What we classically did there is we got rid of a problem. So we worked out that two-thirds of our roofs were having issues with mortar. Um, so the, 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 the British standards banned mortar as a fix on the roof. Um, and then we actually, we solved that problem and created a new one 
is that now you must mechanically fix. You don't have to dry fix, you have to mechanically fix, which can be more to bed with a mechanical fix, or it can be a dry fix system. Yeah. The market exploded with dry fix systems. Um, and what the, the key thing for pitch roofing is we were used to every roof's the same. So whether it's Marley, Redland, Santoft, the tile turns up, you put more trolley, you muck it in, it goes down the same. You, you start working with dry fix systems and everyone is different. And you can't apply yeah. that one size fits all approach to it. So we started to yeah. see poor workmanship around trying to apply that one size fits all approach to it, which, which you would. Uh, we started to see manufacturers who were just throwing bits of plastic into the market, put it in a plastic bag, charge 50p for it and call it a dry verge. Um, so there was a lot of that going on with, with materials and designs that just weren't appropriate for the UK market. Uh, which, yeah, we had the same with PV several years back with the explosion of fit tariffs. You know, as soon as there's money in the market to be made, people will come in naturally, and you want that. Yeah. Um, but then we need to standardise it. So we bought out British Standards 8612, which is a product standard, which, which looked after Ridge, Hip and Verge, which is where we're seeing most of the issues. Um, so on Ridge, the big issue um, was these things. What, what, are they, what are they, Matt? Um, you know, <laughs> These are what holds down the entire ridge now. So if you're dry yep. fixing, this little bit of metal here, if I bend it, goes over your ridge batten, which if you're looking at the rig behind me, there's this bit of tip here. You can see the ridge, a bit of metal going there going over. So this bit of metal sits over the ridge batten. Immediately, if we're used to mortar bedding a roof, I've got a problem because I'm used to battening all the way to the top. And when I back all the way to the top, this clip, this uh, strap, won't go underneath the top button. So when you're dry fixing, you need to leave the top button off so you can get it underneath, like you can see here. So straight away, if people were going from mortar bedding into dry fix overnight, which a lot of people did, they were battening out the roof, gauging out as normal, getting to the top and work, trying to work out where this fits in, and it won't. Because it goes over the ridge button and underneath your, tile, your top tile button. And then it's your top tile button that actually fixes this down either side. So even when they fudge this in and fold it over the top of the top button, it still isn't fitted properly. The problem with that is what they've done instead is instead of having the clip here, you put a fixing straight through down to the top of the button. And what that fixing is actually going into, it's well fixed into this, and on day one it'll seem rigid, but it's actually fitting into the apex of the roof. So you've got a nail going down into the top of a triangle, which isn't a very good fixing. And then what you're doing is you're fitting half a ton of concrete onto that piece of timber, which is fixed by a nail into the apex of a triangle. And over time, that's going to start rocking. And in my technical manager's office, the picture of a Ferrari with a ridge sitting through the middle of it. Because the entire ridge will fail and fall down the roof. Because all those ridge tiles are fixed into the batten, and the batten is actually fixed into not a lot. Yeah. So, and we know ridges move up there. They're designed to, if you put too much torque on the drill, they'll crack because they're, they're always flexing up there. The timbers are expanding, contracting. There's wind load. They're going to move. And if it's not properly fixed, the entire ridge now, with, with mortar, one tile would fail maybe, and you've got to go and replace it. With dry fix, if you don't fit that batten properly with the straps that are included, the entire ridge comes down your roof, breaks tiles on the way down, and worst case, it kills somebody at the bottom. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's a serious issue, um, but I, I would say still a good portion of contracts that I get into train on standards, yeah, we're still finding these in the skip. Yeah. So if, you know, if you're fitting these, this is the most important bit. This is the bit that saves people's lives and cars um, and keeps the ridge on the roof. As I said, the, main, the standards are all about keeping the material on a water rate, and that is... I, 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 Nick tells me there's a, there's a video on YouTube and he's going he's gonna to post... Uh, the link uh, in the yeah. comments at some point, and people can just have a look at the uh, the way the batten section works. One, one, one of the other things that we wanted to cover quickly was where we think the dry vent ridge packs actually ventilate, because I think there's a bit of, uh, not confusion, but people assume that it's one part of ventilating, but that's not quite the case, mate, is it? Yeah, the, the dry, most dry vent ridge packs will ventilate if the manufacturer tells you it does. It's not given, yeah. it's a check. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because you know, the, the, the primary person, purpose for a dry vent ridge pack is the fixing, ours does. Um, one of the misconceptions is, is that this bit, the corrugated tape, is what vents it, it doesn't. Um, the bit that gives you your vents on the roof is the steel. 
So when you're looking at the packs, look at the seal. And what the seal needs to do is hold your ridge tiles up off the main tile by a five mil either side to give you your clear ventilation either side of the roof. Now on a profile tile, you've got natural curves and that's going to give you some ventilation. On a, say, a mini stone wall or a, you know, a plain tile or a Richmond, you don't have that. So you need something to hold that ridge tile up. If you can see, the end of our, the end of our seal is quite thick. It's designed to hold the ridge tile and not, not, not collapse. On a cheaper system that perhaps doesn't guarantee ventilation, it's very workmanship dependent. If you put too much torque on the drill, you'll squash the end of this here and your ridge tile clamps down on top of the roll and no air can pass through, which means your ridge tile is not, your ridge system is not ventilating properly. Um, so always pay attention to the, the quality of the ridge seal. And always, if you are using a cheaper system that hasn't got that strength and end, be very careful. If you want it to vent, make sure you're not putting too much torque on the seal itself, on the, on the screw, and squashing it down to, to cut off that ventilation. And don't let anyone tell you that the corrugated tape ventilates the ridge because it's gummed up with butyl on the underside, so it can't. Yeah. And it's, it's squashed down with concrete on the top, so it can't. Um, it's not this bit, it's the seal itself that gives you the ventilation. That's, that's fantastic. And just going back to the, uh, the clips, uh, we've got a bit of a, a giveaway uh, coming up uh, towards the end of today, so that's great. Um, obviously, Matt runs our uh, estimating courses. Um, obviously, we've been a bit restricted uh, due to COVID, uh, but we're, we're back up and running. I think we've got a course next week which is great. Just talk to us, just as a tip and trick, one of the things that I think amazed most people was the five metre length trip on a uh, trick on a, on a low pitch roof, Matt. Yeah, so you mean the over 15 metres, the, the raising of the pitch on a yeah. long rafter length, is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, long rafter length, it's one that catches people out. We had a session with NHBC and you know, there were people in the room with the NHBC that didn't know this one. That with a flat tile, and this is exclusively to flat tiles, over 15 metres, the minimum pitch no longer works. So what happens is over 15 metres, every metre over 15 metres that roof goes, the minimum pitch goes up by two degrees. Um, and this will vary somewhat between manufacturers, so always check with your manufacturer. Um, but certainly within the BMI advice, over 15 metres you should be calling the technical office because the advertised, let's say a Cambrian, 15 degrees, you take that up to 16 meters, it becomes 17. And it's all about that sideward movement of liquid down the roof. You know, there's got to be a limit on a tile for that because eventually the amount the water's coming down the tile, those minimum maximum pitches are all about the speed of liquid and the drainage from the roof. It's all about getting the water off. Um, yeah. So if the roof, the raft length's too long, on a flat tile, too much of that water's moving sidewards, it starts to flood the interlocks, gets into the roof and causes you problems. And it's a classic for a, you know, a, a flat Richmond or a Cambrian, it looks nice on a low pitch, long rafter length, almost a perfect storm, and then you don't spot that, that issue around the minimum pitch, and all of a sudden you've got leaks around the bottom three or four, three to five courses, um, because it's gone over that, that 15 metre length. So it's a big old roof, but they do come along, and it's one to it, watch out for. Also, uh, can you just, uh, I didn't plan this, but obviously you've talked a lot in the SMA <coughs> courses about the water moving sideways across the roof, like you just mentioned there. Can you just talk a little bit about it? Because I found that fascinating as well. So, Sorry, I've got you lost there a sec. So talk about oh, the move of okay. the liquid down the roof. Yeah, where, where it moves sideways and you, you, you get rid of the sand finish and, and stuff like that. Yeah, so, I mean, essentially the, the whole roof is there for, for a means of drainage. It's all about taking the water away, getting the water off. Um, so the whole, yeah, the, the whole industry is named after it, the pitch. Um, is all about draining that pitched roof. And as that water, what you want is as quick as possible, it hits the tile, goes straight down the roof and into the gutter and away, and there's no longer a problem for the building. Um, but on the, you know, the larger the roof, the more that water starts to creep. Um, and if you've got wind-driven rain as well, so you've got, some, you've got some weather up there, which is pushing the liquid sidewards, as ideal as it would be in a lab that the water goes straight down, it doesn't. Um, so obviously the, the, the longer the roof, the bigger the roof, the more probability is that, that water is going to move across the tiles and not just straight down. There's, a, there's also looking for features in the roof that do this. So you might get funneling, you might get one roof projecting onto another, or a dormer where the small, you know, got a smaller roof projecting onto the main roof. 
And obviously that water isn't all, all, also badly placed pipe details. Um, and the water coming from those isn't going straight down. Uh, the water is actually going to come out and move sideways across the tiles. Um, so often looking at areas where either because of the size of the roof or because of the design of the roof, that water can't travel straight down towards the, you know, the ejection point. Um, you know, it's very much like flat roofing where you're looking at the fall of the roof and you want to make sure the water hits the roof and travels in a straight line as much as possible to the outlet. Um, on a pitched roof, you want the water to hit the tile and travel in a straight line as much as possible down towards the gutter. Um, it's why, you know, the, the interlocks there, so most of our tiles we're using have got interlocks. They're designed to carry that liquid down the roof, but there's a limit. They can only take so much. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's why we have limits on pitch and headlap and so on. It's all about managing how much water that, that tile can manage at that angle on the roof and to get it off the roof. And that, and that also has a bearing on when the pitch stops, when they're sand face finished tiles as well, does it, Matt? Absolutely. Obviously, as you'd expect, the sand, a sanded tile will slow the water down. Yeah. So the slower the water's going, the more opportunity it's got to creep across the tile. Uh, so that's why you'll see a difference in pitch expectation from a sanded to a, or from a granular tile to a, a, a clean painted or through colour tile. Um, there'll always be that difference there because the granules of the water, as the slower the water gets, the more it creeps to the side. Interlock. So it's not a lot, it's not a big difference, but it's a difference. And the, That's the key fantastic. There is... Yeah. Got a bit of lag on this map. Yeah, just lag for a second there. That's all right. Yeah, I was just saying well, we'll, just never mess yeah. up. We get calls all the time about, you know, I've got a tile, I, you know, I want to fit a Cambrian, 15 degrees, the roof's 14, is that okay? No. Those, those minimum pitches, and you'll see, that, you know, they, they, between the tiles, it's only in increments. It's you know, 17 and a half to 22, yeah. um, but they are designed to sit at that level and no other. They don't go below those minimums. Very important. Obviously, uh, we're quite, like yourselves, we're quite heavily into training. And I know and I've done some posts on social media trying to, trying to promote it, but the BMI Apprentice of the Year, um, that's not long kicked off. Can you talk to us about that, Matt? Absolutely. We've always supported colleges. Um, we see you know, one, of, one of their corporate social responsibilities um, is to put back into the communities where we operate. And we do that by donating product, CPD, support to local colleges, uh, wherever we can. Uh, we saw a natural extension to that to support those apprentices in the colleges was to have an opportunity to bring them together once a year and have a competition. Um, there's already skills built for the, the skills, the roofing, but what, what we were interested in was the people. Um, so we were interested in, in looking at the best and brightest from the apprentices of the, you know, this year's cohort, bringing them together, exposing them to business leaders within the, in the industry. So we get um, company directors, um, the other trade federations in. Um, and we, give, we expose them to that kind of wider industry. And we also yeah. challenge them. We get them doing team exercises around customer service, uh, presentation skills, uh, like a Dragon's Den business competition over a two-day period. And we, we judge them on that as well. We've got two teams of judges, flat and pitched. And we're, by the end of it, we have a, a gala dinner with an apprentice an award for the Apprentice of the Year, flat and pitched. And it's based upon, you know, very much on the person. You know, what, what we see is those rising stars from within the apprentices who are going to be our next MDs of the next, next major roofing company of tomorrow because they've got that and it, it, it's a transformational experience for them you know they're they're doing things they don't do in college they've never done before potentially um you know they're they're writing presentations and even that the way you enter is you write a mini essay based upon kind of a values question say about inspiration or motivation and they put something into us on that um, fully supported by their tutors um, but they, they give us an entry which is based on them as a person and their aspirations so yeah, really fantastic competition. We're running it again uh, this year, 17th, 17th, 18th of November. Uh, we encourage anyone that's employing apprentices to, to get involved, to just contact your local college or contact us directly. And we're very happy to hear um, any contractors wanting to put someone forward for it. Yeah, I think, I think Nick's going to post I'm a probably... link. I think Nick's going to post a link. And when does that, yeah. when does the, when is the closing date for entries, Nick? Matt, do you know? End of this month. End yeah. of this month is, is the closing day. It's 10 of September. 
Uh, the important bit I didn't miss out is there's a thousand pound prize for both the winners, and mm. um, both in flat and pitch. So they walk away with a cheque for a thousand pound. So it's uh, nothing to be sniffed at. And even if you're a finalist, uh, you walk away with a goodie bag worth a few hundred pounds worth of tools and and paraphernalia, hoodies and so on. Um, so we make sure everyone goes away with something. You all get a, they all get a stay in a five star hotel and a slap up dinner at the end of it. So the hard work's made worthwhile. But those two winners get a thousand pound each, and uh, they tend to spend it on their tools and their business and their uh, what they want to do with the yeah. future. Yeah. Um, so far, so we have some really nice yeah. stories about how they've invested that in their future. But that's not compulsory. What they do with it's their own business. Yeah. I, I, I've met some of these. I, I've <laughs> met some of these guys up at the uh, roofing exhibitions uh, where you guys get them in to do demonstrations after the event. And some of them are just, well, all of them are just fantastic. You know, so I, I would encourage yeah. um, if you're watching, if you're a roofing contractor, you've got a young lad who's an apprentice and, uh, you know, we want to we want to push them forward. We want to get these guys uh, up to a high skill level. I mean, I've been I've been in the roofing merchant business 30 odd years and all we've ever talked about is a lack of skilled staff. And we need to get these young guys trained uh, as apprentices um, and, and get them into these competitions because there's some fantastic work, man. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They're, they're hugely skilled. Um, you know, they're, they're fantastic skilled in terms of what they do. And it's also raising aspirations within the industry. That, you know, there's, that you, there's a lot you can do once you're in roofing. There are so many directions you can go in and, and can build your career. And it doesn't have to be self-employed. You know, mm -hmm. you know, the, the apprentice here isn't just about making people go off and be self-employed. Just within, within the different businesses, you know, you and I work for two of them. Yeah. And once you're in the, once you're in the industry... There are so many opportunities and really it's, it's, it's just opening up to that and seeing it's not just about do your apprentices, then you're a roof for the rest of your life. Well, you know, that's absolutely fantastic too. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's a whole industry out there for them to get involved in and raise those aspirations and let them have career paths and try to open that up to them. And I think yeah, that's how we attract young people into the industry is by showing there's a whole variety of things that once you're in, um, you can work towards and aspire to. Uh, right up to you know, having your own roofing business and employing people and being the boss. And, um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's not just about well. it's not just about the big companies either, mate. It's, it's, it's all size roofing contractors can put these no. forward. No, absolutely. It's uh, I think our last two winners were from very small local contractors. Um, just yeah, you know, one of them was the boss's son. I think there was for ten people working for the business. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's. You, it, it, there's no restriction on size or who you are, where you are. Um, the only restriction is you need to have an apprentice and put them forward. Yeah. More apprentices. Well, that's, that's, that's flat, flat, out. flat out. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, that's you know, I, I know in the early the early days of us setting up the training academy here, we went to the Leeds, uh, Leeds um, College uh, where they run some fantastic courses. I know that's a bit far away. There, there's colleges closer to us than Leeds, isn't there, Matt? There is a good network of colleges. I mean, we're happy to share that, that we've got a list of them we work with. We're happy to share that with yeah. JJ's. But it's, um, yeah, you know, we, we, there's, there's Leeds, you've got Bolton, you've got Newcastle, you've got Eastern Roof Training. There's not just the colleges, there's also the roof training groups that are set up. Yeah. Um, so there's one, you know, just South Wales down the road from us here. And yeah. also the South West, you've got Devon College. Yeah. And um, there's colleges all over that are offering the apprenticeships, um, either through, through the manufacturers or through yourselves at the NFRC. It's, you know, we're happy to help contractors find them because we know that can be, you know, if, if your world isn't training, trying to make sense of it and find out where you can send people is an issue. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're always more than happy to put people in the right direction and support them because we're working with that network. So, yeah. you know, the, part of the reason we do that is so we can open that up to our customers. Um, it's all about adding value to the customers. So. Oh, well, I've, met, I've met a number of the, uh, the, the ladies, really, that run the training groups. And they work ever so hard uh, in trying to set these courses up and getting people involved. They're all across the country. They are committed. They are committed to roofing training. I, I must yeah. admit, I've never seen a passion like it, really. And they do, uh, they do a fantastic job. You know, if you want to get involved in them training groups, just Google uh, roofing training groups. And there's, there's, there's groups all across the country doing fantastic work to help uh, the youth of today really become the roofers of tomorrow. So I think it's fantastic. Talking about training, obviously we've got our own uh, roofing training academy that we try to do our own little bit. 
we, we're, we're running estimating courses, Matt, at the moment. Hopefully, at some point, we'll be back on the rigs with the guys um, once uh, everybody feels safe. Talk to us about the estimating course just quickly, Matt. Yeah, so the estimating course is it's one of our bread and butter courses here at the, the Academy of Said Cerny. It's one we've delivered for you umpteen times. It's a two-day course or one-day course. We do two variations of that. And yeah, we've got the, the workbook we take them through. And it's, it's paper-based, so it's not about learning to use Swift Desk or any of the other um, programs that are available in the market. Um, <laughs> it's about actually the underpinning knowledge behind it. Um, so what, you know, it all comes down to the information that you put in at the end of the day, whether you're using a computer or not. At some point, someone's measured something and put a number in, in, into something, and it's giving you the skills to do that. Uh, yeah. The main thing is building up a mental muscle about being able to see a 2D drawing on a piece of paper and seeing that as a 3D drawing in your head or seeing a building in the world and knowing what that would look like on a piece of paper. So we take you through a load of exercises to start you looking at the paper and actually creating a building or looking at a building and putting it on paper uh, and taking you back and forth and doing that because that, that mental muscle is, is the underpinning bit which helps you. Go, you know, once you've got that, it actually helps you right across the industry. You can look at a drawing straight away you can say, oh, that's a hip, that's a valley. I know what product should go on there. And then it's the next step on from that is we teach you to do the takeoff. So yeah. we'll show you how to you know, take that roof, take the dimensions and turn that into a shopping list, essentially, um, for what should be on that roof to make a full system. Um, but it's, yeah, we, you know, we, we show you a number of shortcuts on the way, but I'll not tell you those now. You've got to on the course. No, no that's um, fantastic. We'll show you how to avoid... How to, yeah, it could be called how to avoid trigonometry. Um, <laughs> it's could be the sometimes for it. But it's, uh, we, we give you some tips and tricks about how to work around and work out rafter lengths and um, complex roof areas and so on. Um, so we, you know, it's, it's a good day. Um, yeah. It's well worth doing. I never have any complaints about it. And no. um, we'll blow your mind. You'll walk away thinking, "Whoa, that's a lot." Um, but we, you know, once you actually take it on board and start using it, it's really valuable stuff. Yeah, it's great. We we uh, we obviously try and send as many of our new starters um, on these courses, and you know, the biggest of our customers send uh, their guys along, whether they be experienced who have been doing it forever or have just joined their company. And uh, yeah. I think like a lot of the training we do, everybody gets something from it, um, which is the important thing. We, we've obviously got a giveaway. We've, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we've got a giveaway of one of their estimating courses um, for this week's course, uh, which is great, or for a future for a future course if you can't make Thursday. But just talk to us about, we spoke about a giveaway um, backed up. We try and do that on Never Just a Roof. So we talked about giveaways with Redland Interfix clips. Um, just talk to us about what you're willing yep. to do for someone who's been on the, uh, on the, on the stream today. Yeah, so if you tell me what towel you're working with, I'll give you five boxes of the Interfix clips. Yeah. So that's 500 clips. So I'll put together a package for you for your tile. Yeah. Um, so we've got some, you know, that, that's a good, good wedge of clips. It'll do a good chunk of your roof, and we'll give you those clips as a, as a, as a thank you for, for entering that. Um, so you know, that's uh, said the coin. Magazines are fifty, and you get ten of those in the box. So fifty, they five hundred to a box. We'll give you five boxes of those. Um, in terms of the training, which talk through that as well. Yeah, we we, the, we uh, spoke about dry ridge, didn't we, and all that stuff, really. So. Absolutely. So what I'll do is, for one of you, if you want it, um, on the table as well, is I'll come out to site, spend the time with, with yourself and your, your team, um, do a tour toolbox talk on Ridge and Verge. I'll bring a box of each out. You can keep them. Um, so a 10-metre box of Ridge and a box of, of Verge, of, of dry, Redland Dry Verge. Um, and we'll just do a toolbox talk going through the installation. I won't install your roof for you, um, <laughs> but I will tell you how to fit it and, and talk through the system and how to fit it properly, and how it fits into the standards and so on. So you can get a bespoke on-site toolbox talk, um, arranged at our mutual convenience, and I'll come out to site and work with you on that happily. And, uh, yeah, that, that's on how, how are we going to pick that? So the, the that at random, yeah. Yeah, so we, we'll pick someone purely at random, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll exchange details with Matt, and then between, uh, between the winners and Matt, you can arrange to uh, get a little bit of this... This uh, very knowledgeable guy's uh, information. You know, he's always at the end of the phone. He's always willing to talk to, to anybody uh, to try and help us uh, improve, yeah. whether that be our staff 
or whether it be contractors, um, it's good to have a, a point of contact. You know, I'd like to say thanks, really, because it's good to have a knowledgeable point of contact that we can get it, if you, if you pardon the pun, from the horse's mouth. Um, what people do after that is obviously is, uh, it's, it's their choice. But we want to we want to try as a company, as an industry, give people the the best uh, information that we can. So that that that's fantastic. Um, we're nearing the end now because uh, we've uh, gone a little bit over time. But there's nothing wrong with that. I, I like rambling on uh, as much as the next person, which is great. Um, just a few fun questions, Matt. So, have you got oh, wow. any okay. not embarrassing? But funny stories um, or little one-liners that have happened on uh, training sessions that you've been running. You're probably saying no now, probably. But <laughs> I'm trying to think of one that didn't happen to me, although it isn't X-rated. Um, <laughs> so funny stories from a training session. <laughs> oh, it, it's uh, yeah. We, we get funny moments all the time, but I think. Um, you put me on the spot with that one, so I'm trying to think of one that's uh, that's good. Ooh, give us one that's not so good then. Doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to be a blaster. <laughs> oh, I think I think the one that sticks in my mind is when we had a uh, we had the boss's son come in from a from a merchant, um, lot JJ's, and the will name remain nameless, who yeah. had got some of his friends employed of the business and thought it would be a fantastic idea to take them out on the, 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 the middle night of an estimating course, in fact. Um, so he took them out, and he used the wrong credit card. Um, and he went to somewhere he shouldn't have. And they, both, they all turned up the next morning, a little bit shamefaced, and had to go back and explain where they'd been the night before with the company <laughs> credit card. It's, uh, so we've had that one. I've also had a, it's always the boss's sons, actually. I had another boss's son turn up, and thought, because he's the boss's son, he didn't turn, have to turn up to the second day. So he just sent a note with his friend, to send in a certificate in the post so he could show his dad he'd been. So I sent half, a, I tore it down the centre and I sent half a certificate to him and the other half to his dad with a note saying what he'd done. So it's, uh, yeah, so always watch out for the boss's son when they turn up on the courses. I think that's the one to, to watch out for. You always get a lot of behaviour from them. It's, uh, yeah, but I'm sure most of them are wonderful people. And they I'm are sure, really yeah, I'm sure they uh, are. Yeah. Have you ever had anything we've, we've had you... amusement, but... Have you ever, ever, ever had a product and I suppose it's a bit of a, a, a loaded question, really. But what what product has amazed you the most by either not taking off like you thought it would, or taking off like you never expected? The, well, I'll go for the never expected. I think the the one that you know, you work for a manufacturer. Obviously, everything that we produce is wonderful, and we love all their products. They're all fantastic. Nothing wrong with any of them. Uh, but you have your favourites. Um, I think. The, the two for me that stand out um, was Inifix, the Inifix clip, which we've already looked at, um, because, because it didn't just fix one problem and then move on. It didn't just tick the box. There, there was actually some real work and thought that went into, okay, we're changing this product. How can we also address other issues in the industry and bring that into it? And there was like a really nice, you know, right, I was involved in the setup of the project right from when they brought it over from Malaysia. Cause that's where it came from, from fitting tiles onto and uh, rail roofs. Um, so it's got a real nice story to it, how it came into the country, um, and also how it was developed, then launched, and the uptake of it, and just seeing that grow and become a standard offer for the business. You yeah. know, it's, it's true innovation. It's not a big, you know, clips are never a big earner for a manufacturer, um, but they're an integral part of the system. They're all part of keeping that material on. Um, so, fun, yeah, that fantastic product. The other one that I really love is, is Wacker Flex, Rocky Flushing, which is their lead replacement product. I just love that product. It's... Uh, it, it was one of the early entrants into the market, um, came into the back of a lot of uh, kind of um, bitumen-based flushing materials. It was a butyl-based material, um, stretches in both ways, so ideal for pitch roofing. But the most important thing, welds to itself. Yeah. Um, so it's got this wonderful property to it, whereas if you've seen it, you stick two pieces together, it becomes one piece. Um, I love that product. Yeah, absolutely loved it. The one that came in I had some hopes for and didn't quite take off, was roof putty. Um, so that was that was an amusing little product that came in. Still out there, still being used. Yeah. But I think for us in the business, that never really caught the customer's imagination. Um, but those boxes of roof putty, it was fun to play with. 
I enjoyed running courses on it, so it was, uh, <laughs> I was hoping it would stick. But it never, it never, well, it did stick, but it didn't stick with us. It's, uh, so that one was uh, an interesting one to, to look at. How, how on earth did you get? Anywhere. How on earth did you get into the job you're currently in, then, Matt? Oh well, I've, I've been in construction and training for about twenty years now. Um, yeah. General construction before this, but most recently, obviously, with BMI ten years with Redland and now BMI. Um, so I came from adult education, um, and then once in adult education, started with Learn Direct Business Link. Um, slowly drifted towards construction. So by the time I left Business Link, I was mainly dealing with construction firms. I then worked with a trade federation, National Federation of Builders, um, for just under 10 years, working with them um, and you know, working with contractors, general contractors, more and more into training, creeping more and more towards technical training, and then came here um, to take on the technical training manager role. So by the time I left the NFB, I was part of the, man the training management team with the NFB. Um, and then came here. So it's been a kind of a creep starting in adult education, a lot around technology and so on, but moving from tech into roofing. But I still keep the tech. I still enjoy the tech. So we still play with the VR and AR and, yeah. as you know, drones and all those good things. Yeah. Um, but it's, I, rem uh, I remember yeah, you just bringing, roofing. It's... bringing the VR stuff down to our uh, roofing trade show. I keep being reminded of me uh, walking around as I'm going to fall off the edge <laughs> of a building, which... Uh, adds to everybody's uh, hilarity of the situation of what happened there. That's great. Um, Absolutely. Our CPI, obviously, we've talked about pitched roofing today, but obviously BMI um, with ICA Power are obviously very heavily into flat roofing. We will do a um, never just a roof on flat roofing. What's your, what's your penchant for? Is it pitched or is it flat? I am pure. I'm fifty-fifty. So my roles um, across both. Get off the fence. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm no. I'm I'm welded to the fence, Steve. Um, no, I yeah. actually love both. I mean, on the liquid, on the on the flat side, I love liquids. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's the real. I love the innovation side of both industries. You know. So on the pitch side, I, you know, I love Camry and I love the clips. I love the, you know, all that all the new stuff. I mean, the concrete's great, but getting into the new technologies is brilliant. And over on, on flat, liquids are a fantastic product to you. They're still, you know, they've been around for 30 odd years, um, but they're still a baby for construction. Uh, and there's a lot of innovation there, a lot of applications we've only started to scratch the surface of. Um, you know, they're still, that, that industry is still, you can tell by the number of competitors in the field. Yeah. You know, if you want to see how mature it is, look at how players are in the market. And in liquids, you've got, you know, loads of, you know, 60 on, you know, at least major players there. Um, and so many different materials and chemicals to work with and yeah, new technologies, terminologies. So I really enjoy that side of things. I haven't quite got the knack with, knack with the torch gun yet. So you know, I think that is, that is the key with uh, flat roofing is pitch roofing, all the complexities in the roof. Um, it's kind of learning the roof. But flat roofing, the last four or five years, I've been learning that the complexity is all in the, the system itself and the knack that actually you know, is storing that, that system correctly. Um, and that different layering and the variations of so, yeah, intensely interesting both sides and firmly and always will be um, swallowed the blue pill and well into the fence, Steve. <laughs> well, we'll, 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 we'll run a session uh, on flat roofing because I, I love a bit of flat roofing. Um, and, and we'll do that later on, maybe later in the year or early in next year. Um, and last, last fun question then, um, are you a Marmite lover? No, hate it. Do you really? I'm in the hate camp. Don't like Marmite. No. <laughs> Even the smell of it. Ugh, horrible stuff. That's great. Well, we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're at the end now. As I say, we've run over uh, uh, a little while, and there's, there's, no, there's no bad thing in that. Obviously, I'd like to thank you um, for taking the time uh, to help us run the second um, episode of Never Just a Roof. The third episode will be in uh, October. Um, we've got a guy. You talk about liquids. Um, we've got uh, one, another really knowledgeable guy uh, called Tyrone Elkins from Restec, uh, Roberts Manufacturing, um, who we're going to have uh, on the stream. Um, he's fantastic with flat roofing and liquids. That's great. Um, we've really appreciated your time. I hope everybody's enjoyed it as much as I have. I can talk about this business forever, as most people know, uh, but there's nothing wrong with that because I've got a passion for it. Um, Please remember to try and follow JJ Roofing Supplies uh, Instagram channel um, so that you're notified of the next uh, 
uh, upcoming versions. We've got loads of fantastic, we've got some fantastic people lined up for this, some characters, some knowledgeable guys, um, and some people who are big names in the roofing and construction industry. So I'd like to thank everybody for our time. Thanks very much, Matt, for coming on, on today. That's been, it's been really helpful. Yeah. Also, just obviously we talked about we talked about a giveaway just before I get Nick, Nick's just nudged me. We have got um, a giveaway of one space on an estimating course. Um, we have got a course this Thursday at Crickwood. It's a bit short notice, but if that's something you'd like to jump on board with, maybe for a future course, uh, just let us know and we'll see what we can do because it is a really it's a full day's course. It's a bit uh, 100 miles an hour, but it is a really really good call so matt runs it so it is it is going to be good so i'd like it's to thank yeah. yeah i'd like to thank everybody for for watching um i'd like to thank matt for um taking all my uh, unknown questions that i've uh, thrown at him today which is great because things come up in your mind and you think well, i'll ask that um sometimes i don't know the answer so i'd rather ask that we look forward to <laughs> seeing everybody um on the next never just a roof um, which will be live stream in October. Look out for the postings, tell you when it's come. And I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in. You have a great day. Thanks very much again, Matt. Can't say thanks enough. And just remember, if it's on the roof, we stock it. You have a great day. Thank you, Steve.